And so, in comparative obscurity, as a professor at the Virginia Military Institute, this man who sounded vast fields of unexplored knowledge, a man both great and good, mighty in mind and noble of heart, finishes his benevolent life. So pay tribute to Matthew Fontaine Morey, for no great liner sails the sea today without benefit of his study of the ocean and its weathers. Today, Annapolis stands as a monument to his long-sighted dreams. The Panama Canal is a reality, not merely his vision. Our coastal defenses are tribute, silent tribute today, thank God, to Maury, who saw their need. And with the aid of the government's weathermen and their predictions, the very bread we eat grows more readily from the ground because of a naval officer with a crippled leg. And Cyrus Field himself gave Maury credit for the Atlantic Cable long before either of them suspected its ultimate and intimate possibilities. The very planes that sail the skies of 1939 still roar aloft by virtue of Matt Morey's invention of weather reports, now flung into space with the speed of light. So, Matthew Fontaine Morey, long unsung genius, you are an honor to Virginia, an honor to America, an honor to civilization, and in gratefully recognizing you, we can but honor ourselves. Honor then, to whom honor is due, Matthew Fontaine Maury, the Pathfinder of the Seas. The death of George Floyd while in the custody of the Minneapolis Police Department as the world is in the grips of the COVID-19 pandemic spurred massive demonstrations. The Black Lives Matter movement gathered moment, greater momentum as other incidents came to the surface and shed light on issues lying in the open sight. The naming of 10 U.S. Army posts for Confederate generals became a heated subject of debate. Statues of prominent Confederates, slaveholders, and racists were attacked and defaced. In England, the statue of Winston Churchill and the Nelson Column were the subject of vandalism. The U.S. Navy is facing a similar issue to the Army. The cruiser Chancellorville, named for a Confederate victory over the Union in the Commandant's residence at the U.S. Naval Academy, named for Franklin Buchanan, who became the senior admiral of the Confederate Navy, have all been targeted for renaming. But perhaps the figure of most significance was the one discussed in the opening video. Matthew Fontaine Morey has a statue on Monument Avenue in Richmond, along with Robert E. Lee, Jeb Stewart, and Stonewall Jackson. He has an engineering building named for him at the Naval Academy, and in 2016, a survey ship was placed in service with the Navy's Military Sealift Command bearing his name. The question posed is, should Mary Maury be co commemorated with a building, statue, and a ship as he resigned from the U.S. Navy, broke his oath, and served the Confederacy, and supported slavery? To ad address this question, I have gathered together an all-star team of historians from across the MCU, Maritime Colleges and Universities of America. Uh, first, we have Dr. Penelope Hardy from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Uh, she holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins and is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. We have Maggie Stark, a doctoral candidate from the University of Connecticut. We have Dr. Michael H Varney from Drew University, a PhD from the University of New Hampshire, and Dr. Jason Smith from the University of Southern Connecticut. He holds a PhD from Temple and was a visiting professor at the U.S. Naval Academy. I am Sal McCogliano from Campbell University. I'm the host of the NASO Video and Podcast, and I want to welcome everybody here to our podcast today. So welcome, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Happy Juneteenth. It is a very appropriate day for us to be doing this is on Juneteenth, the anniversary of the end of slavery. And this panel actually came together because of some discussions among uh, members of the North American Society of Oceanic History. Uh, we had some emails going across, and, and the decision was made to kind of pull this group together to talk about this issue, which uh, we seem is very appropriate. Uh, maritime historians, uh, you four are probably some of the best versed and, and well-knowing of Matthew Fontaine Morey. So we thought we'd start off with a brief little kind of background on Morey, and then we'll go into the topic of whether or not Morey should be venerated the way he is. So I'll start with uh, Margaret Stack, uh, if you want to go ahead and, and kick it off for us. Hello all. Uh, so Matthew Fontaine Maury is, as you can probably tell from him having a monument in Virginia, born in Virginia um, at a very young age, moved to Tennessee. Um, and his career in the Navy started in 1825 um, when he obtained a um, commission as a midshipman with the help of his family friend, Congressman Sam Houston. Um, he followed his older brother, John Minor Maury, into the Navy, who had died of yellow fever in the Caribbean the year before, 1824, while under the command of David Porter. 
Uh, Maury had a fairly undistinguished early career, um, although he was part of, he was attached to the um, Brandywine when the Brandywine returned, Marquis de Lafayette de France was on board the Vincennes, which made the cir circumnavigation of the first US Navy circumnavigation of the globe. Um, but Maury really came to national prominence in the late 1830s, early 1840s, when following a devastating carriage accident, uh, which damaged his career or his ability to go to sea, Maury wrote a series of articles for the Southern Literary Messenger and other publications across the South, like the Richmond Whig, um, which addressed what he saw as severe shortcomings in the United States Navy. And in these articles, um, in the Southern Literary Messenger, he wrote under the pen name of Harry Bluff, writing scraps from the lucky bag. Um, he advocated for the professionalization of the officer corps, um, improved education for young officers, which would be one of the impetus, impeti, pardon me, for the foundation of the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. Um, but one thing that I think is really important to talk about in the context of Maury's beliefs and activities was the way he advocated for an expanded United States um, naval presence along the southern coast of the United States and particularly in the British Caribbean or close to the British Caribbean, um, a space of some contention between the United States and the British Empire following the 1833 abolition of African slavery in the British Empire. These articles were written, um, or the most prominent or most important of these articles were written uh, between eight, April of 1840, June of 1841, um, and it sort of directly led into his later career um, in the Navy um, and his rise to prominence as a early hydrographer and the quote unquote pathfinder of the seas, which is something that my colleagues, Penn and Jason, are going to fill you in on. Thank you, Maggie. We're going to go ahead and, and switch on over to Jason and have Jason Smith. Uh, Jason uh, is well versed on this. He's the author of To Master the Boundless Sea. A recent book came out 2018 from UN, uh, UNC Press. So uh, we hand it over to Jason. Sure. Well, that's a nice um, segue from Maggie. Uh, you know, it's it's in the context of an, an early voyage as sailing master in 1831 around Cape Horn um, that Maury really um, begins to understand really the central importance of the marine environment and, and understandings of of the of the the oceanic world uh, to matters of navigation. Um, and, and particularly the difficulties of rounding Cape Horn uh, in, in the days of the Age of Sail. Um, and so from there, he really begins to immerse himself in navigational subjects. He um, publishes a, a piece on the navigation of Cape Horn from his own um, observations and, and called from the observations of others. Uh, this leads two years later to a, a treatise on navigation. That's uh, one of the early texts assigned at the Naval Academy when, it is, when it's established. Um, and then because of a stagecoach accident that deprives him of the utility of his right leg in 1839, um, Maury finds himself in command of um, the depot of charts and instruments, a fairly new organizational structure within the Navy that really brought together as a, a storehouse uh, the Navy's navigational equipment, including its charts. Um, and from there, Maury really um, revolutionizes, I think, the activities of the depot, which becomes the Naval Observatory and Hydrographical Office two years later in 1844. Uh, under his command, uh, he begins, uh, you know, a, a widespread and, and fairly comprehensive um, a method of research that employs American mariners and, and increasingly international mariners in contributing environmental data of all kinds. Uh, to the observatory uh, that that then, as of the late 1840s, uh, culminate in Mari's uh, series of wind and current charts, which um, you know really I think revolutionizes in a cartographic way the way that mariners understand and look at and use the ocean and the marine environment, uh, saving lots of money, uh, insurance rates dropping, the, the the voyages to various ports dropping in, in some cases by half. Um, and a narrow wind speed, you know, meant, meant money and profit uh, by, wind, by, by way of winds and currents. Um, Maury is also known um, for the publication of his seminal work, The Physical Geography of the Sea in 1855, um, uh, you know, which in a lot of ways brings together an emerging 
if nascent field of, of, of the marine sciences, bringing them together in one, in one book. Um, and in a, in a fairly literary way as well, in the way he frames this, it, it reaches a wide popular audience and, and really gives him the, the sort of credentials of, of um, you know, Pathfinder of the Sea and father of oceanography, even though his reputation was quite contested at the time uh, by rivals and peers in the scientific community uh, and has been since. Um, so um, I guess I guess I'll I'll leave it there. Um, other than saying that that also within the Navy, his own reputation was was called into question as well. It was not just in the scientific community that his scientific reputation was questioned. Uh, he um, we would see himself as the victim of the plucking board of 1855, the Naval Efficiency Board, which sought to sort of um, remove the dead wood of the Naval Officer Corps in a time of stagnant promotion, um, particularly because of his in leg injury and his inability to see. Um, so he he was um, put on the the um, uh, put on the list for half pay uh, and got himself ultimately reinstated by appealing to Congress and to the Secretary of the Navy. Um, but he was a guy who had his foot in all kinds of communities, the, 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 the marine science community, the naval community, the civilian merchant marine and whaling community. Uh, in some cases, he was in, you know, in many cases, he was an outsider in all of those, um, but managed to sort of bridge these divergent communities in really interesting and powerful ways. That's great, Jason. I appreciate that. Mike, we're going to come on over to you. Uh, you did a, t uh, a paper not too long ago on, the Dip I believe it was in Diplomatic History, about his role, especially regarding slavery. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, yes, I'd be happy to. And um, I, I do want to note that, that last night I was doing my uh, research in preparation for this and reading a lot of my colleagues' uh, articles who are, who are here with me, and I'm really honored to, to be with them. Um, I... Uh, would would be very happy to talk about Maury and slavery. And I think it's an, important to note as uh, a theme that kind of links uh, the previous uh, collaborators here is that Maury was a Southern Whig. And that um, what that meant was that the Whigs in general had a very bad case of what's called the hammer principle, where if you carry a hammer, then everything seems like a nail. And for Whigs, uh, they were far more comfortable with using the government to resolve uh, problems as they saw it than, than Democrats were. And this is something that links uh, a lot of um, Maury's efforts, whether it's reforming the Navy or trying to make uh, oceanic commerce more uh, profitable and faster. And it also links uh, this issue of, of slavery. Uh, Maury believed that slavery uh, was a uh, very, very uh, problematic issue for the United States, and particularly for, for white. Slavery was a problem that had to be managed for white safety and white prosperity, and he was intensely concerned about the increasing slave population in the South in the late antebellum period, and he, he thought that there had to be a place where excess slaves could be sent off. And in the context of Northern opposition to the expansion of slavery in the West uh, in the 1840s, 1850s, he grew very, very concerned that there wouldn't be a place uh, for uh, Southern planters to sell or to migrate with their slaves. And so he actually started looking uh, past the Caribbean, which a lot of other pro-slavery expansionists were, were looking at, and into South America. Um, his, his great fear here, uh, ultimately, was that there would be a massive slave uprising and a race war. Uh, he is conscious of the history of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, he, uh, as a Virginian originally, uh, though a Tennessean uh, by early childhood, he remembered Nat Turner's rebellion uh, in 1831. And he really thought that unless, this is a quote here, unless some means of relief be devised by which the South can get rid of the excess of her slave population, the two races will join in the death struggle for the master, end quote. So my article um, examined this, in particular, Maury's organization of and lobbying of uh, a um, survey over the course of two years, between 1851 and 1853, of the Amazon River Valley uh, in, in Brazil. And Brazil uh, was a slaveholding nation where slavery was being entrenched, uh, just like in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. And uh, Maury dispatches uh, his brother-in-law, William Lewis Herndon, to lead this, this expedition. And Herndon comes back 
and he reports that Brazil and the Amazon is perfect for, for slavery. And Maury's plan uh, here, which he laid out to his brother Herndon, uh, brother-in-law, excuse me, uh, in a secret letter from 1850, he says, he explains his plans very, very concretely. He says, your going is to be the first link in that chain, which is to end in the establishment of the Amazonian Republic. For when the government has done what I have been urging it to do and what it intends to do, viz. secure by treaty the right to navigate that river, it can no more prevent American citizens from the free as well as from the slave states from going there if their goods and chattels, chattels being slaves, to settle and to revolutionize and republicanize and Anglo-Saxonize that valley. So he had this vision uh, that uh, his expedition would result in essentially another Texas revolution, but this time in Brazil, and that would establish um, a Republican, pro-slavery, Anglo-Saxonized uh, republic. So it's that um, element of his, his past, which I tried to highlight uh, in my article, and that is uh, something for us to ponder today. And I look forward to discussing it with everyone. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that setup. Uh, take us last but not least by any measure uh, to Penn Hardy. Penn, you are an accomplished historian on this subject. You can, you can speak oceans of, of amount, I'm sorry for the bad <laughs> pun there, uh, of detail on this. Uh, but one of the reasons that we're all here is you wrote a blog post uh, that, that specifically addressed this, uh, entitled Reckoning with a Racist Legacy in Ocean Science. So I wonder if you can kind of set that up uh, with what you wrote. Sure. So as uh, the, the, everyone's given a very good background here, um, and, and the argument has long been for people who look at statues like the one in Richmond or names on buildings like the one uh, at the Naval Academy, and they argue, look, Mari uh, resigned his commission in 1861 and went with Virginia to the Confederacy and served as a Confederate officer, but he spent most of the war in England, not even in the South, uh, and what they're recognizing by having statues and buildings named after him uh, are his contributions to science beforehand. And his contributions, as, as Jason suggested, were many. Um, he did some pretty significant um, chart work. He organized the first international meteorological conference in 1853. Um, so really, he certainly his science is very important. And I'm a historian of science and technology, so that's uh, the angle I tend to look at him from. But we really can't look at uh, our argument. I wrote this blog post with Helen Roswodowski, who's a historian at University of Connecticut, um, and we're both historians of oceanic science. And our argument is you can't really look at, you can't separate these facets of Maury's past. Um, he was not a scientist um, and then sometimes also racist. Uh, his whole method of investigating science um, and what Mike was talking about with this expedition uh, down into the Amazon Valley, into Brazil, um, he also looked at Peru and Bolivia as potential places that we could, could, could transplant American race-based slavery. And he's investigating this, sending people out to investigate this in the sort of scientific style of the time, which involves going there, uh, using lots of instruments to take, lots of measurements to try to find everything you can out of, out of place. But among the things he wants to find out is uh, how is the environment suited um, for, the, for, the, for the employment of slaves to do labor. This is part of a um, racist understanding of human science at the time um, that was very broad, that, that white scientists tended to believe that um, white people could not function in very humid and hot environments, uh, but that black people, because they came from Africa, the theory went, and where it was a very hot environment, they were sort of naturally suited to work in these areas. And this was part of the justification for slavery. So he's using this sort of science, scientific, and I say scientific, not pseudoscientific, because it was absolutely mainstream science at the time, understanding of humans and race um, to advance these scientific projects of investigating the world, which tied into his political projects of projecting American power and in particular Southern power. He did spend much of the uh, Civil War in England, but that didn't really put him outside of the conflict. Uh, he was sent there uh, by the Confederate government in order to try to acquire 
uh, commerce raiders, ships that would have the purpose of going out to sea and seizing American merchant shipping and either taking it or sinking it. Uh, so he is sort of you know, making war on the very people who had helped him crowdsource the information for his maps. Uh, he had, when he was putting his wind and current charts together in sailing directions, he had gone to the merchant fleet, to the American whaling fleet, and ask them to make observations and turn over logbooks. And they had complied because uh, the charts he was producing were so useful to them as well. So he is basically really turning them back, his back on the very group of people who had helped him the most. The other thing to note is that um, the project Mike describes of uh, investing in Brazil and, and sort of scheming to perhaps build an American-based republic there, uh, that would essentially be uh, transplanted Southerners carrying enslaved people with them and a safety valve for slavery in, the, in Brazil was not a one-off. He did not just do this one expedition and talk about its possibilities for slavery. Uh, this was an ongoing project. And at the end of the war, when it became very clear that the South was losing the American Civil War, Murray actually entered negotiations with Maximilian I who was the European-backed um, ruler of Mexico uh, and entered Ma uh, Maximilian's employment uh, and to start a project there to get Southerners to emigrate to Mexico where they set up a colony uh, called New Virginia. And the idea would be, again, that Southerners would go there, start plantations and uh, bring, their, bring enslaved people with them as the war ended and that was no longer possible for them in the American South. Uh, he didn't give this project up uh, until several years later. He was afraid to come back to the US after the war because he was afraid of being tried for treason. Um, he finally, for one thing, started hearing more and more Confederate officers not being charged and being given parole. Uh, but also he went to England for a trip while working for Maximilian and while he was gone, the French government withdrew its support for Maximilian and Maximilian was overthrown in Mexico. So it wasn't sort of a voluntary end to this project of trying to export American slavery. So our argument here is you can't separate these things. You can't separate Maury science and celebrate that and somehow not understand that his um, racism and his support for slavery were intimately tied to that science. Uh, they were part and parcel. Uh, so this, this picture that uh, Sal has up is what started our thinking for the blog post. This is the base of the statue to Murray at Monument Avenue in Richmond. Um, and someone has graffitied it with, a, it says, F this guy too. It's a very sort of offhand, uh, it looks like the person doing this, this is not personalized to Murray. Probably the person doing this would have understood who Lee and Jackson and the rest were, uh, but Murray's just another guy who's up there. So countering the argument that many people have, we can't rename buildings and take statues be kept down because that is somehow uh, getting rid of history. Clearly this statue of Murray does not seem to be teaching his whole history. So we argue that the statue should be removed, that the Naval Academy should rename the building and many other places that have schools or buildings named after Murray should do the same. Um, absolutely, we should consider his history. We should keep um, understanding and, and investigating and teaching that history, uh, but keep it in the history books where it belongs and where it can be contextualized. And we can look at Maury as this sort of rounded whole picture um, where we can understand his science is important, but not uh, sort of lionize and celebrate him without recognizing uh, the sort of warts that go with it. Penn, I think I think that's the big issue that you set up there, and and I have a distinct recollection. Fifteen years ago, I was a, a visiting professor at, at U.S. Military Academy, and I remember being in a meeting with with fifty historians from that department, ten civilians, forty military, and uh, they were doing a new public relations. They were doing a new poster for for West Point, and the West Point poster featured the people who influenced the cadets, and there were four figures on there: Ulysses S. Grant in the middle. There was there was Eisenhower. Uh, there, there was MacArthur, and at the very bottom was Robert E. Lee. And, and, and me being the young, naive person I was, raised my hand. is like, are we really sure we want to put Lee on there? Because I'm pretty sure he was on the other side. And, and the response I got back was, well, no, he was a commandant here. He, you know, we, we, we look beyond the, you know, his actions during the Civil War, and what we look at him is for being a good, and this is the quote, good American. 
and, and and I think this is the the fundamental issue we're we're facing right now. The military has got ten bases named for Confederate generals, and some of them are just <laughs> amazing that they're named for these people. But they were named during World War One, World War Two. The U.S. Navy has named vessels for Confederates in the past. Uh, one of the two of the ballistic missile submarines were named uh, USS Stonewall Jackson. I actually used the term Stonewall Jackson in the name. And the USS Robert E. Lee. The, the Lee was sandwiched between the Teddy Roosevelt and the Abraham Lincoln, which is mind-boggling in, in many ways. And, and so I'll open up for the panel here. You know, what should be the position here of groups like the Navy Academy, the U.S. Navy, regarding people like Maury? Like you said, I think Maury got tagged on, the, on Monument Avenue there. People didn't know him, but they assumed, well, he's with these three guys, so he must be an issue. Uh, but at the same time, play a devil's advocate here. Are, are we destroying history? I mentioned in the opening about the uh, tagging of Winston Churchill and Nelson's column in England and the fear that that kind of rolls over. And do we start tearing down the, the next argument is Jefferson and Washington. So I open it up to the panel for a discussion. Well, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, I think so many of these names and so many of these memorials that are you know that are conceived and 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 erected in the late 19th and early 20th century you know they're very much a, a product of their time these memorials you know they they're they're more reflective in many ways of the views and anxieties and the you know the passions of the people who conceived of them you know maybe the next generation after the civil war the, the children of the civil war the children of so many confederate officers such as mari's daughter who was i think central in the the creation and, and impetus behind the the Richmond Memorial, you know, so many of these are are a product of their time, and they're they're a product, I think, of of the the this perceived need uh, to reconcile um, across sections. You know, the sort of stuff that David Blight talks about in Race and Reunion, in which that emancipationist view of the war is largely maligned, if not forgotten. Uh, and you know, and northern, northern and southern whites are, you know, are are are, are championing a, you know, some sort of lost cause vision uh, of of honor and bravery, you know. So I think even, you know, even in the in the context of the Navy, you know, this is a national organization that in the 20th century is trying to re reunite and reconcile sectional differences. And so that's where those names come from in a lot of ways, and not 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 in all ways, but in a lot of ways. And so I think it's important to recognize the reasons, perhaps, why those things were named what they were, those buildings, or why the monuments were erected, and that, that can serve as a point for sort of moving on. So I think that, as Penn suggested, and to answer your question, Sal, you know, the, the taking away of names um, or the, the tearing down of monuments is not, is not the erasure of history. Uh, um, in many ways, it's, it's a revision of history. You know, you can look at the graffiti or the, I hesitate to even call it graffiti, but I would, I would call it a, a sort of re-commemoration of Mari in, in that paint on the statue. You know, it's another generation of a different perspective coming along and reinscribing, perhaps out of some ignorance about who he actually was, but with a vague sense that he's related to the Confederacy and white supremacy and the preservation of slavery, um, reinscribing what that means. Uh, and I think that's okay. I mean, that's, that's you know, it, it may be in a cruder form, but also in a more powerful form, what historians do all the time, you know? And so, um, you know, to uh, it, I think that the, the the solution for the Naval Academy is yes to change the name of Maury Hall and and Buchanan House, um, and 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 if the if the superintendent of the academy wants to really talk about systemic racism and the history of that within the naval service, you know why not invest more heavily in history and the humanities so that those midshipmen. Uh, can have a better, more critical, more contextualized, as Penn was saying, sense of who these people were. That's that's what that's what deep historical study does. Monuments and memorials and names are just they're they're crude uh, and and clumsy ways of dealing with the past that are that that don't they're not able to show the full picture. No, I, I, I entirely go ahead. No, I was just to 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 piggyback on Jason's point and what you said earlier about when the submarines had been named, um, just to throw out a timeline for these things, right? The statue in Richmond was erected in 1929. So this is not an immediate memory of the Civil War and of recognizing his service. This is later. Um, the building at the Naval Academy is from the early 20th century, the aughts. Um, and, and that was a period at the Naval Academy where they were sort of 
consciously looking for um, a sort of naval heritage and people that they could celebrate. Uh, John Paul Jones's tomb comes in at the, about the same time and the idea of him being the father of the Navy. So it's really this conscious creation of a uh, heritage um, that Maury gets involved in. The 1929 date, uh, as historians like Adam Dombey, uh, who, who wrote um, False Cause, uh, and, and I should credit him, he's the one that, that gave me that picture of the statue in Richmond, uh, and Karen Cox, uh, these people are pointing out these statues, many of them were put up not in the immediate aftermath as a memory of the war, but during an era of Jim Crow laws being passed and some later statues also uh, during the civil rights push in the mid 20th century. So they were very explicitly put it up uh, with a white supremacist agenda that they would be sort of symbols that would show the black population that they ought to sort of remember their place. Um, so aside from whether these individuals deserve to be remembered in any specific way, uh, we need to, and, and those kinds of historians have looked at the speeches and conversation among the people who organized and erected these statues as to what their intentions were and take them at their word that their intention was a rewriting of history themselves, that they wanted to create their own sort of heritage in which um, they were the good guys and the winners and everybody else sort of knew where they belonged in the hierarchy and stayed there. Maggie, go ahead. One thing I, or to piggyback off um, Penn and Jason, uh, one thing to note about the 1929 date of the um, erection and dedication of the statue of Matthew, Matthew Fontaine Maury in Richmond, uh, the dedication and the celebration of the statue occurred on November 11th, 1929. It was specifically dedicated on, um, oh man, Armistice Day, not Armistice Day. Um, Veterans Day. Thank you. Um, as part of the exercises in remembering um, the military action of World War One, Maury got rolled into this as a veteran, which I think ties back to Jason's point about um, David Blight, Race Reunion, and the project of uh, reabsorbing Confederates and the Confederacy into the American military past with the recognition of um, Confederate veterans as American veterans, for example. Um, so, and agreeing with um, Penn and Jason, I don't see the taking down of, say, the statue of Matthew Fontaine Mori as sort of the old sort of like Roman Demnatio Moria, uh, Memoria. It's not erasing him from history. Rather, we're allowing for a better recontextualization of Mori, because clearly the statue of Mori isn't ed isn't providing any of this necessary context. Um, and, and statues inherently don't do that. I, I mean, again, unless you have a guided tour with a you know a consummate historian with you many times they don't give you that context at all. And, and I go back to the early 1920s you're talking about, which I think is very key. We're, we're trying to create Americans, you know, in World War One, we're getting rid of the state units, we're going into a full US national, the the, the, the boot camps are, are schools for Americans, and, and really trying to create this Americanism of, of, of a unique nature. And, and you're right. I, I mean, whether it's at the Naval Academy at West Point uh, and just in everyday life, they're trying to, to to create this. And so they're creating this I almost shy away from the lost cause, because I think we're trying to rewrite the history of everything. And it's not just it's not just the South trying to rewrite their history. I think we're trying to rewrite all American history in some ways to create this unified nature to it. Mike, I, I was really interested in your perspective on on talking about the expansion of, of slavery, something that Maury does not get associated with, but this very much expansionistic view you know, we tend to forget the filibusters, you know, the, the, the greatest immigration problem between Mexico and the United States wasn't Mexicans coming to the United States. It was U.S. It was Americans going to Mexico. That, right. that was the issue in the, in the 19th century. You know, if only they built that wall along the Louisiana border, you know, and, and kept the Americans out. But I was wondering if you could follow up on that a little bit, because I think that's a really interesting perspective and get your view on this. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yes, I uh, um, to, to that point, um, one of the things that was intriguing to me and in my research was to the extent to which the Brazilians were fully conscious of what uh, Mori was was up to, the British were as well, uh, and the Bra Brazilians felt pressured in sort of the culture of 19th century science to uh, allow this exhibition to go forward because they felt on a uh, level of public face and honor that they had to acknowledge Mori's status uh, as a scientist, as Penn has really eloquently argued that he was um, accepted 
uh, widely in that role. And uh, Mori, of course, in his public statements really emphasized simply commerce and science as the uh, objectives of, of the mission. He did not uh, talk as explicitly about slavery, but Brazilians had really been alarmed by uh, the Mexican-American War, and they uh, felt that, um, rightly, that Mori and others like him were hoping to replace them in their own countries uh, with uh, slaveholding lights and with their, their human uh, uh, bondsmen. And so, uh, in some ways, to turn the, the uh, analogy even further afield, the Brazilians are worried about white American uh, and, and black American immigration uh, in this period as well. And they, they fight very conscientiously uh, by sending out diplomatic uh, emissaries around South America uh, to try to prevent any of these countries, Ecuador or, or Peru or Bolivia, from signing uh, trade treaties with the United States with an eye to, to blocking this kind of expansion. Um, so, Maury, you know, to get back to the question about uh, monuments, I, I, monuments, particularly historical monuments, have a special purpose in society of communicating some value or a series of values from the past that we want to share. That they are inherently uh, celebratory and um, commemorating. And because of that, I think we have to uh, look at them very, very deeply. Um, not simply as, as uh, you know, as others have sort of mentioned here as, as uh, expressions of academic history, uh, but really as cultural celebrations. And Maury, you look at his efforts to expand slavery using science, and he relied on meteorology and his ocean uh, currents to come up with his idea about uh, settling the Brazil, uh, Brazilian Amazon with uh, slaveholders and, and with slaves. Um, his, his views don't really well align with our views and what we want to be as society today. Uh, in addition to disparaging uh, and really having very little sympathy for, for Black Americans, uh, he viewed Latinos and Latinas in uh, very negative lights. He thought that they were an indolent and imbecile uh, race. Um, and so uh, when you look at the totality uh, of him, and, and it is true that he made um, really uh, innovative and important contributions to, to ocean navigation, ocean science, oceanography. I think that the, the totality of his values and what he, what he stood for, what he believed in, uh, do not um, ring as something fully to celebrate uh, today, with the possible exception of science. But as that notes, this science is intimately related to racial science of, of the time period, so it's hard to separate both of those. Um, I do want to get on thin ice for a moment. There's also the Herndon Monument. So Herndon uh, was the commander of this operation. He knew very explicitly that it was a pro-slavery operation. I know that the Herndon Monument uh, has uh, a cherished place at the Naval Academy. I know that there are some traditions. Uh, Penn probably uh, tried to climb it when uh, she was a student there. Um, but there is no mention at that statue, at that monument, uh, of, his, of his role in pro-slavery expansion. And um, while it is true that, like, like Maury, he might have a few things, particularly you know, his, his heroic uh, death on the Central America in 1857, he went down with, with the ship and, and uh, put the safety of everyone else around him before his own, uh, which was, was truly a, a chivalric thing for him to do. Um, this other part of his past also deserves mention. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that if he had lived through that disaster, he would have fought for the Confederacy. Let me go to Penn and then to Jason real quick. So Penn, do we have a photo of you climbing the Herndon uh, Monument? No, I was actually already out for summer training when my class did that, but we um, do hold the the record for the fastest climb of a Greece, the Greece Herndon Monument. But um, no, I think that's what sort of has saved Herndon from being central to this conversation so far is that he died before the Civil War and therefore it sort of never faced that decision, right? Um, but Mike's right. He he was absolutely part of a new, um, and and he too was a Virginian and and agreed with um, Maury's plans for for this expedition and what they were trying to accomplish there. I was just going to say, in terms of 
uh, this this broader question that, that we've been talking about of what use monuments serve i think mike put it very well in terms of the that they sort of embody values that we as a society want to hold up as representing us and and to sort of um set as goals or or figures that we want to strive to be like and especially at a place like the naval academy uh, the naval academy's mission begins to develop midshipmen morally mentally and physically and it's not a coincidence that morally is the first thing on that list. So if that is indeed the mission, um, then do we want someone who was a scientific racist, um, who was for the retention and expansion of slavery, and who was a traitor, who left the US Navy and actively worked to um, kill Americans in the Navy Merchant Marine? Uh, for the duration of the war? Is that someone whose example we want to set out um, that will help to develop midshipmen morally? And I, I would I would say no. And, and it's always interesting to me the, 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 the parallel, or, or actually the opposite, I should say, between the, how the Confederates are treated versus a guy like Benedict Arnold, which West Point was named after Fort Arnold. There's, there's no mention of Fort Arnold at all. He's completely eliminated from everything except for one stone near a chapel up there. And, 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 and yet you can make the argument that even, you know, new literature coming out on Arnold shows that he was more interested in creating a, a different type of America than what Washington was doing. So, Jason, I want to come on over to you. I, I think you had something there. Yeah, I think, you know, Mike really put his finger on it there and Penn uh, nicely elaborated. You know, I think that it, it, in, with this question of Mari, you know, the, the Academy and um, the American society more broadly are dealing with, I think, two questions that are related but also different. What, what do you do with memorials uh, and remembrances of Confederates who fought against the very nation that is memorializing them? That's one question and that's complicated but it's it seems like you know to a historian it's a pretty straightforward answer there's a related question what do you do with military figures or political or cultural figures of any kind that is, have espoused historically you know white supremacist or racist views right the two are related um, but that seems to me, uh, as Mike, I think, suggested with Herndon, a much more complex, even more complicated question, right? Because it opens up all of American naval and military history and all of the heritage associated to the critique, uh, you know, of historians who wonder what the racial and racist views of these figures are and whether they should be celebrated. Um, um, you know, it, it, do we, you know, um, not only reckoning with Herndon, but, you know, so many military figures and their views toward Native Americans and, and, and throughout American history, uh, toward, as, as Mike suggested, towards people in Central and South America, um, towards Japanese people, um, despite, I mean, of course, the United States is fighting a war in the mid-century against the Japanese, but, um, you know, if, if we really want to talk about feelings of and notions of white supremacy, you know, and we open it up farther, it's going to open up a lot of military figures, some of whom we, you know, we, we enshrine and, and we've ennobled uh, to, to much darker scrutiny, maybe rightly so, probably rightly so, you know, or even, you know, perhaps even more problematic issues of misogyny, patriarchy, uh, um, sexism in the military, which is obviously a big issue now. Um, you know, how, how, how would, how would these, how, how have these military figures talked about women? Um, you know, er Ernest King, you know, was well known as a womanizer. Um, you know, so, you know, so it, it, it has the potential to open up even more complicated questions about who these people were and how we should understand them. As a historian, I think that's a good thing, you know, but for the military services, that, that could be a real challenge. And, and if, if, if the superintendent at the academy is truly interested in, um, in, in, in bringing this issue to the fore, it's gonna, it's going to require real reckoning with what the Navy has done, uh, both good and bad, and who naval leaders and and naval personnel were historically, which is complicated. Well, that that is the slippery slope argument that that you know when you start imposing 21st century morals on 19th and 18th century figures, you know where where does it stop at that point? I, I mean, for me, always it, it it figures like Moray and Buchanan, they broke their oath. They broke an oath, and they did what was textbook treason. I, I mean. It, it is it is literally the, the only crime spelled out in the Constitution. They, they performed it. 
And, and I think one of the things that, that becomes, you know, I'm a New Yorker who went to the University of Alabama and I teach a Civil War course in North Carolina. So I, I, I have to deal with many d different facets of this view when I teach this course. But I, I always think one of the most amazing things at the end of the Civil War is nobody gets tried for treason. No one, you know, in any other country in the world, you, you take Jeb Stewart, you take, you, I mean, not Jeb Stewart, you take a Robert E. Lee, you take a, you take a, a Jefferson Davis out and, and you shoot him. But not in the United States, because, again, there's that issue about reconciling and, and putting everything back. But there's also the point of at what point do you erase what they did do and, 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 and reflect on that? And the military, in many ways, is a controlled environment. You can, you can enact social changes within the military. And perhaps this is something that the military needs to do. Maybe those 10 army bases need to be changed. Those, those, those buildings need to be changed. But the question is, I guess I pose to you guys, is, is what prevents us from going down that slippery slope all of a sudden and imposing those morals on those historical figures? So, Maggie? Right. Um, my personal position on this is I'm very leery of the slippery slope argument, especially where I, when I hear it in um, current political discourse in the 21st century, um, because I do think this, in terms of current political discourse about um, 19th and 18th century attitudes, it frequently seems to purposely ignore the fact that there were people in the 18th and 19th century who believed that Maury was wrong, who believed that the institution of slavery wrong, who believe that the uh, the use of the United States Navy to enforce American will on the Caribbean or not enforce, say, the international um, ban on slave, the slave trade off the coast of West Africa, you have people arguing in the 1840s, 1850s, in Maury's lifetime that all of this is wrong. So my position as a historian is that saying that there was only one voice in the past, and this was unilaterally accepted in the past, is an act of historical erasure that, or it's a national project of misre misremembering the past, of pretending that there was only one viewpoint about slavery and that it was acceptable. Um, in which case, I agree with my colleagues that we should be having these conversations, we should be opening ourselves up to these discussions as a Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Whew. We should open ourselves up as professional historians to having these discussions and pointing out that there wasn't a monolithic belief in slavery in the past. And that is important context to people like Matthew Fontaine Maury. Ben, go ahead. Yeah, 100% what Maggie said. Um, I want to point out that probably we became professional historians partly because we like our history messy and complicated and we understand that it's always going to be messy and complicated and then i'm simultaneously capable of holding in my mind respect for the scientific work and, and recognition for its importance that maury did uh while considering his actions to advance slavery and his treason against the united states uh deplorable and so i can i can have both of those things and understand them both at the same time and, and see how they interrelate the other thing is as professional historians we understand history is never a finished product it's not like we found the answer and now we put up a statue and now it's done and we should never re finish, re revisit this subject, right? History is constantly being reappraised and reinterpreted and better understood. And sometimes that's because we actually find out new facts. Uh, we find some source nobody's looked at or, or something new comes to light. But often and probably more often, it's because we are reconsidering um, historical people and historical events in the light of current developments in society. And so it's absolutely appropriate to do so. And I agree with Maggie, the this, this slippery slope argument, I think, is an effort to declare certain topics in history finished and stop us trying to complicate them or investigate uh, their sort of um, more complicated wrinkles and just leave them alone and let them sort of be a pretty picture in our past. Uh, and, and I think what I try to do when teaching is uh, convince students that actually uh, it, history is more interesting and more useful when you look at it as this complicated and messy picture uh, instead of trying to declare it done and put a bow on it and walk away. 
it's why you get a Bachelor of Arts in History, not a Bachelor of Science. Two plus two is four, but, you know, Maury plus oceanography doesn't equal great person. You know, th- there's more to it than that. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I, I agree with all of my, my colleagues here, and I, um, I'm i very uh, grateful to, to Jason for laying out sort of the ways in which, you know, this discussion uh, with Maury also opens up other figures to analysis. And I think with, with Jason, with Penn, with Maggie as a historian, uh, I think that conversation is long overdue. I welcome that discussion. And I think that uh, we can uh, trust ourselves uh, to be adults and to uh, figure uh, these things out in a very nuanced and, and complex way. In, in terms of, of Maury, um, I appreciate uh, you know, the points about uh, treason, I also appreciate Maggie's uh, point that uh, it's not as if slavery was universally accepted uh, in the 1840s or 1850s. It was a very contentious topic. And um, in Maury's own family, it was a contentious topic. So one of the letters that I found in the course of my, my research uh, was uh, from a cousin of Maury's. Uh, she writes, this is Mary Blackford, writes to Maury in January of 1851. And I think this letter actually is, is really helpful uh, for us. Uh, Blackford was uh, a cousin. She was uh, very anti-slavery, involved in the American Colonization Society, which, which had its own issues, uh, but nonetheless, uh, very consciously and, and adamantly anti-slavery. And she writes this to Maury. I have just laid down your pamphlet about the Valley of the Amazon. The first part I read of enthusiasm, my whole heart dilated with pleasure. How proud I was of the same blood flowed in our veins. We might bracket that and say, there's oceanography right there, oceanographic science. Uh, Next part. But when I came to the part about perpetuating slavery in a land where it had been abolished, of opening a new and lucrative trade in human beings, with all the separation of husbands and wives, mother and child, all the numberless ills that flow from slavery and the slave trade, my heart sickened. Yes, if a heart could bleed, mine did when I thought that one so near me had proposed this mighty wrong, the greatest of all wrongs, the degradation of the human soul. It's a very powerful letter that I think um, we should all feel that way when we look at any individual who tried to actively promote slavery and really meditate on that that great uh, wrong. And I think that Blackford, uh, Blackford's letter deserves to be um, given uh, due consideration when we think about how to remember Maury. I, you know, when I, whenever I think of Maury, I'm, a, I'm always torn a bit on Maury because as, as a merchant mariner, I sailed for seven years. I, I used his wind and tides charts and for voyage planning. So I, I was a beneficiary of the modern version of what he started out to do. But as a historian of the Merchant Marine, I despise Maury for unleashing the commerce raiders that, 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 that you know, that ran the Merchant Marine off, off the high seas. But I think as a historian, most importantly, that that I, I look at these moments as great teaching moments. So these moments that we have to embrace and 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 get out there and get the context out. One of the reasons for pulling you guys together for this panel is is to have this discussion about well, we got to get rid of Maury just because he was a Confederate and he broke his oath. But there's a lot more to those details than, than just that. So I, I thought we should begin to wrap this up. So I want to go around, uh, do a round around the panel here real quick and have some of you guys uh, give us your closing thoughts. So Jason, I'll, I'll come to you first. If you don't mind. Sure. Um, you know, I think that um, there are, you know, I, that's a really wonderful passage that Mike just read in a lot of ways. And, uh, and, and so I'm thankful for that. Um, and your point about uh, your merchant marine experience and the, the charts that you use that were sort of the, 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 um, the descendants of what Mari did, um, there's, there's a, a nice line in an otherwise sort of troubling biography of Mari from the 1960s um, in which the, the author talks about um, the, the, the prevalence of Mari's name on the Navy's hydrographic charts. Yeah, that, you know, once upon a time, I'm not sure that this is still the case, especially in the age of digital charts, but, um, you know, these charts included, you know, founded upon the researches of MF Mari. Um, uh, you know, and, and she's, the, the, the biographer Frances Williams says, um, says in a lot of ways that she thinks that for Mari, that would have been his, you know, his favorite kind of memorialization, right? That 
that you know he didn't maybe he wouldn't maybe want the the huge statue at the globe on monument avenue you know but there are other ways of enshrining his memory um perhaps also problematic but but that that he could be remembered that way his friend and former and and fellow confederate naval officer raphael sems who used Mari's wind and current charts to tra to chase down um, American merchant vessels and whaling ships during the Civil War um, said that, you know, he saw, you know, he gave Mari a sort of eulogy at the end of his life. Um, he saw Mari's influence in every wave that that passed by, you know, in every storm that was gathering on the horizon. You know, so I think there, you know, for different kinds of people who interact with Mari in different ways, there are different ways of memorializing him. Um, which is, I think is an interesting thing to think about. The last thing I'll say is that I think if, if Mari's name gets taken off of the academic building at the academy, there are many others that could stand in for him in, 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 in perhaps superior ways. And I would put my, uh, put my own recommendations as Mary Sears, the oceanographic, uh, the, ocean, the leader in oceanography during World War II, member of the waves, a uh, fundamental uh, uh, foundational figure in the history of naval oceanography, uh, or Matt Henson, Matthew Henson, um, the um, uh, uh, Perry's uh, uh, assistant, uh, perhaps his superior in a lot of ways in his quest for the North Pole, uh, two people who could easily, um, whose names could easily um, uh, be on, on on that academic building. And in many ways, you know, uh, the former Moray Hall would be a, a, a teaching lesson too, you know, to be able to use that and, and, and educate along those lines. Let me go over to Maggie and, and uh, have Maggie chime in here with her closing remarks. Hey, so first off, thank you for having me be a part of this discussion. And I'm pleased to be in the such illustrious company. Um, I do think this is an important and timely discussion and I suppose I'm on record as saying I do think that the Mori statue should come down and I do think that we should continue to have these contextualizing discussions about what Mori did and why he's here. Um, and I do think as part of this larger conversation, perhaps another dis direction we should be thinking about is the other ways to which or in the era of the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, in this era of <laughs> naval reformation, naval expansion, naval professionalization, think about other ways or think about the other ways to which the United States leveraged naval power to its own end in these decades leading up to the American Civil War, which is, of course, part of a much larger discussion about American expansion, American or American expansion, and American imperialism. Um, but I do think this is a really good start, an important start to have talking about the very conflicted legacy and the the past or the next lives of Matthew Fontaine Maury, the ways to the purposes to which he was rediscovered and dusted off and re-remembered in the 20th century. Thank you for having me. Well, thank, thank you for saying that, Maggie. Mike, we'll come on over to you. Wonderful. Yeah, I, uh, I sincerely enjoyed uh, this discussion and I, um, 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 really still meditating on some of the points that, that my colleagues have raised. And like Maggie, I, I feel very uh, fortunate to be part of this. Um, as far as, uh, you know, this, this question of what the, what the Navy ought to do uh, with uh, Maury Hall Naval Academy and uh, the monument in, in Richmond, which I understand is uh, really more of a, a governor and city issue, and also its ship names, I, I think that these ought to be changed. I think that uh, Maury Hall uh, ought to be renamed. I think that the Maury Monument ought to be removed. Uh, I think we should think about the Herndon Monument uh, in addition uh, to that. Um, in the interest of, as a historian, I think that that these items, even the plaque on Maury Hall, uh, could be moved to a museum and could be preserved and analyzed uh, there. I think that um, perhaps you could even enlist the middies to help uh, remove some of these uh, monuments as a moral uh, exercise. And I think that uh, there are a lot of other figures, uh, and I appreciate Jason's suggestion of Mary Sears, um, who could be highlighted in a way that would reflect our values today, that we wanna become a more inclusive society for people of color and for women, and therefore uh, our public monuments should uh, reflect uh, that kind of diversity that we're hoping to see. Well, Mike, I appreciate those remarks, and uh, we're gonna end it up with uh, uh, Dr. Hardy. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that has just been said. Um, if if these monuments need to come down, the names of buildings need to be changed. And if the ship, the USNS Maury, uh, needs to, to change. I think Jason's suggestion of Mary Sears as someone to name the building for is a fabulous one. She was uh, an oceanographer in uniform during World War II. Uh, she'd be a great choice. There already is a USNS Mary Sears, so we can't uh, rename the ship after her. I was trying to think of suggestions for that. I asked a classmate who is an oceanographer, um, and she suggested Walter Monk, who was a long-term oceanographer of much importance in the 20th century, an immigrant, uh, so it would sort of recognize another kind of American. I was thinking of people like uh, Ernest Everett Just, who was a um, Black uh, marine biologist who would be good. In terms of the building, uh, Mary Sears might be a good choice. Um, a group of alumni is very interested in, in putting forth the name uh, Captain Jennifer Harris, who was a Naval Academy graduate and the first um, female Naval Academy graduate to die in combat. She was a helicopter pilot uh, killed in Anbar province, Iraq. Uh, so there, we have something like 73 Medal of Honor winners uh, who are Naval Academy graduates. There are plenty of people we can choose to name that building after who did not commit treason um, or, or argue for the enslavement of humans. Uh, so I think this is uh, an important conversation to have. I hope that um, whether we today have a direct effect overall, I hope um, our voices will have some effect on that conversation. And I'd go back to something I think Jason said a while ago that uh, if people are worried about this, um, hiding history or ending conversations about history, what they need to do is worry less about the monuments and more about funding for education so that we can continue to tell these complicated, messy stories and uh, challenge uh, midshipmen and other students and us as citizens to think, um, in, in to engage these difficult questions and, and be willing to tackle what our past means for us today. Well, I think it's a great way to, to end this up. Uh, I want to take a moment and thank our panelists. I want to thank Dr. Jason Smith, Dr. Michael Varney, Dr. Penelope Hardy, and the future Dr. Margaret Stack soon. Uh, we we're hoping uh, to uh, get everybody together again for future discussions. Uh, this discussion really started at the beginning of this week. It was very quickly accelerated. We have just started three weeks ago the NASO video podcast. And so this is just our seventh recording. And so I, I think this is a great way to really bring together some great people, some great minds together to talk about a very timely subject. So I want to thank our, uh, our panelists for getting up. Some of them got up very early this morning to, to come in. We're working on different time zones right now. Uh, it's early on Friday, uh, June 19th, Juneteenth. Uh, so we're going to be go ahead and getting this out very quickly. Uh, we will have links to all our panelists so that you can follow them. And, and, and if you have further conversations or, or, or comments, feel free. Uh, if you liked our podcast, be sure to click like on YouTube or give it five stars on your podcast provider. Please subscribe to our channel to receive updates as we continue to interview maritime historians and hopefully have more discussions like this in the future. Uh, you can follow NASO on Facebook or on Twitter at NASO underscore history. The best way to follow NASO is to become a member. The North American Society for Oceanic History has a deep uh, background, some great research, some great personnel, as you can see right here. Uh, you'll receive our newsletter, our quarterly journal, The Net Northern Mariner, which we publish jointly with the Canadian Nautical Research so Society. The best way, as always, to be a member of North American Society of Oce for Oceanic History is to join. Go to www.naso.org, click on membership to join. Uh, I want to thank our panelists again. And until our next talk, keep sailing. <laughs>